everyone, welcome to today's COVID-19 update for Yakima County. My name is Jocelyn Castillo, Community Health Specialist at the Yakima Health District. Uh, joining me today are um, our Emergency Response Coordinator, Nathan Johnson, and Environmental Health Director, Sean McGee. Thank you both for joining us today. And they'll be providing information on the COVID-19 vaccine and the new reopening guidelines in just a moment. Uh, to start off, as usual, I'll go over our current cases. Uh, as of 4 p.m. today, we've reached a total of 24,401 cases of COVID-19. Uh, we have 334 deaths related to COVID-19, and there are currently 46 individuals who are hospitalized uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, three of them are currently intubated. Uh, some good news is that uh, here in Yakima County, we are uh, seeing a downward trend in COVID-19 cases. Uh, thankfully, we have also passed the peak in new cases that we expected to see after Christmas and New Year's. Um, and so that is, we, I hope that that uh, good news encourages some of you to continue following the recommended um, guidelines and that it will also uh, continue, uh, help you stay motivated as we um, move into um, distributing more vaccines to the community. Uh, to start off, Nathan will be providing a brief update on how those uh, distribution ever, efforts are going here in Yakima County. Go ahead, Nathan. All right, thank you, Jocelyn. Yeah, so I first want to touch on, uh, we know the governor's announcement yesterday uh, with the idea of putting up these large mass vaccination clinics throughout the country. There's going to be five of them. The two closest ones to Yakima will be Wenatchee and Benton Franklin. And I think it's important for the community to know that that does not mean that there's going to be no opportunity to receive the vaccine in our county. Uh, that is just where the state resources are going. Uh, we uh, locally uh, are continuing planning with our community partners on finding ways to ensure that that vaccine is accessible uh, to everyone and there's not no barriers uh, involved. It's a nice easy process for uh, anyone in the phase that we're in to be able to get that vaccine. Right now uh, we're working very closely with our federally qualified medical centers, uh, our hospital systems and other pharmacies and, and medical clinics who have started receiving the vaccine. Uh, we are following suit with the state so we are moving into also expanding to phase 1B tier 1. So that is, again, the, uh, 65 or older and also 50 or older if you're in a multi-generational family. Um, so those, uh, we're expanding to that, but that doesn't mean that if you're a 1A and haven't got the vaccine that you're, you can't get it. Uh, you certainly still have opportunities to get it. Uh, there's two locations you can look uh, to find where to find the vaccine. There's the findyourphasewa.org, which is a uh, State Department of Health operated uh, website where it will tell you what phase you're in and is a very helpful tool. However, we recommend, strongly recommend always looking at the Yakima Health District's website uh, as we have the most up-to-date and current information on where you could get the vaccine and the bigger portion of how to schedule an appointment. A lot of our partners who are uh, administering the vaccine are no longer or they're not doing any uh, walk-in clinics um, at this point in time. It's scheduling ahead of time. Um, we certainly do not want long lines to form in front of all of our clinics or our hospital systems in front of the ER doors. Uh, we want to be able to have that vaccine available and accessible, uh, but we don't want to impede the healthcare system. So going forward, Again, uh, we continue to, to coordinate with our partners. Uh, we're looking at different ways to have different uh, access points for the vaccine, very similar to how we worked with uh, our testing. Um, we are working on ironing out the details on what exactly that looks like. Uh, we're also working to get enough vaccine to also support those efforts as well. So once we do have that plan in place, when we get the vaccine, it's a smooth rollout. Uh, as of this morning, uh, we've uh, received 9,405 first doses of the uh, vaccine. That's a mixture between the Pfizer and the Moderna. Of that, uh, 6,197 doses have been administered. 
We've also received an additional 3,533 uh, booster doses. That's the second dose um, of the vaccine. And of that, 1,515 doses have been administered. Uh, at this point in time, the state receives weekly uh, vac vaccine allocations. Um, and once it's sent to the state, then the state allocates that out to each county and each organization. Um, so we know we're, we're still in a time where we have very limited supply of the vaccine. Uh, just because an organization uh, receives the vaccine one week doesn't mean they're going to receive the, the vaccine the next week. Uh, so again, always be looking at our website because that's a live list of who, who has the vaccine and how to schedule, which is a definitely a really good tool to have. From that, um, I will say uh, the biggest thing is patience. Uh, I know it's a lot to ask for. Uh, we want to get this vaccine out to the community as soon as we can, uh, but we also need to get that vaccine into our county as well. And uh, until the, the um, supply chain catches up with the supply and demand of the vaccine, uh, we're going to be getting limited quantities, not only in the state, but in the county. Uh, and we will continue to work with our partners uh, to get that uh, available to the community as quickly as we can. Um, just a couple things. I know we're, we're now doing this on recording, not the Facebook Live like we intended, but I did see just a couple questions on our Facebook post uh, that I wanted to address. Um, one was, can educational or other service providers uh, to persons and 1B2 count as persons within that category? At this point in time, it's anyone qualifying in phase 1A or 1B tier 1. So regardless of if you're a teacher um, or work at an auto body shop, if you meet uh, those criteria of being 70 or older or a 50 or older in a multi-generational family or one of our healthcare workers or first responders, uh, at this point in time, uh, the vaccine is available. Uh, again, the biggest thing is uh, you gotta schedule that appointment and um, realize that you know you might not be able to schedule that appointment for later on today or tomorrow. Um, so just again patience with our healthcare providers. Another one is does the does YHD have an idea of how long it will take to distribute these vaccines to all these categories? It's going to take uh, several months to be uh, very honest. Um, again until the uh, supply catches up with the, the supply and demand uh, it's going to take a while for us to get that vaccine into the community and then uh, furthermore distributed throughout the community. Uh, and then there was a good question about what's the plan to distribute with farm workers. That's something that we're actively working on. Uh, we know that uh, agriculture makes up a large population of our uh, county uh, and our workforce. Uh, and we want to do everything we can to protect that workforce protect our essential uh, employees. And again, it's all about making uh, accessible um, or access to the vaccine and not having barriers in between and really making it a streamlined process for our community. And it's gonna take some time, but we're very committed and uh, we have great community partners, our FQHCs or medical clinics or hospitals are really stepping up to the plate and, and doing everything they can to administer that vaccine. Uh, and we're gonna continue uh, making that process better and more streamlined and providing more opportunities for the public. All right, thank you, Nathan, for that update and for answering uh, those important questions um, from the community. Before we move on to Sean, I just wanna remind everyone um, that all of our uh, COVID-19 vaccine information is available here on this webpage. Um, so there's uh, specifically, there's more information too on who's eligible under the multi-generational household category. Category, uh, We know that many of you have questions uh, whether you meet this category or not, and you can just go to our website and uh, read the criteria there uh, to determine if you are eligible or not. Um, also, all the current vaccine locations are listed on this website. And as Nathan uh, mentioned, please note that um, all of these locations have uh, phone numbers or other contact information. Um, so please uh, call ahead of time. Uh, we ask that community members do not um, visit a location without uh, making an appointment first. 
Um, so now we'll move on to Sean. Uh, we still have uh, received questions about the new reopening guidelines. Um, do you want to give a brief update on where we are at with that? Okay, so update on uh, the business side of things for COVID uh, and our roadmap to recovery, where we're at, uh, what's what's happening, all that stuff. Um, so um, we recently entered into the Healthy Washington Roadmap to Recovery. Uh, the entire state has been broken up into regions. Um, Yakima, Yakima County is in the South Central region along with Kittitas, County, Benton Franklin counties, Columbia, and Walla Walla. Um, we are still in phase one. Uh, we got some more data late last week about how we're doing um, and uh, for the four metrics, which I'll go through those real quick. Uh, the metrics are, um, there needs to be a decreasing 14 day trend of, grade, of more than 10%. Uh, there needs to be a decrease in work, decreasing trend of more than 10% uh, in new uh, COVID hospitalizations per 100,000 over a 14 day period. Uh, there also needs to be um, seven day uh, occupancy of staffed ICU beds need to be under 90%. Um, and the last metric is seven day uh, test positivity rate under 10%. So for the South Central as a region, um, we are, for metric number one, 14-day uh, rate of new COVID cases per 100,000. We saw a decrease in 12%. So we are meeting that metric currently compared to the last two weeks. Uh, for new hospitalizations, there was a decreasing trend of 22%. So as a region, we are meeting that metric. Uh, for the seven-day occupancy of ICU uh, beds, we're at 91%. So we're getting closer to meeting that metric. Uh, we need to drop uh, two more percent to technically be meeting uh, the metric for ICU beds. Uh, and our seven day uh, positivity rate as a region uh, was at 19%. So we got a little ways to go in our uh, test positivity rate, but it was down uh, from the previous uh, two week cycle. I believe we were at 22 or 23%. So we are dropping, which is good news. Um, so we remain in phase one. Uh, along with this new roadmap to recovery, there was some guidance I want to talk about that, that we've noticed some confusion uh, around. The, uh, the uh, open air uh, structures for, for dining at, at food establishments, restaurants, bars, taverns, wineries, et cetera. Um, what this document um, shows us or, or tells us is um, is how a facility can utilize uh, its space um, in alternative ways to just um, normal outdoor dining. Um, and I had, here it is, I got to reference this. So what a lot of restaurants um, and food, other food establishments are thinking is that indoor dining is allowed uh, at 25% occupancy as long as we can keep our entrance and exit doors open. Um, that is not the case. Indoor dining is still not allowed in phase one. Uh, it is outdoor dining only in open air structures. So I want to talk quickly about what qualifies as an open, open air structure. Uh, so the open air concept one is, uh, is defined as follows. The seating area has two or more adjacent non-permeable walls occupancy limited to 25% of the seating area as set by fire code. This does not include employees. So what they're talking about here is if you have a, a structure that has four walls, uh, one of those uh, walls must be defined as permeable. Also in the definition of permeable, a normal entrance or exit door does not count towards the permeability of a wall needs to be um, the way I understand it. And as it reads, 50% of the wall needs to be permeable with open windows or a large garage or bay door. So if you have a four, uh, four wall structure and on one of those walls, you have uh, two large bay doors that you can open it up and keep the fresh air flowing through that structure, um, you may do that, 
but you have to have CO2 or carbon dioxide monitoring or uh, monitoring devices showing uh, carbon dioxide part per million levels at all times, which the requirement is to be below 450 parts per million um, at any point. And if you are 450 parts per million or above for 15 or more minutes, um, people utilizing that space for dining must be moved to a, um, a different open air structure or uh, direct outdoor dining. Um, that 450 parts per million is the threshold for ambient, ambient outdoor uh, carbon dioxide levels, which are about 400 parts per million. So we have about 50 part per million buffer for these um, open air structures to work with. So concept number two is um, one, two, or three walls are permeable with multiple fully open windows or bay doors. Uh, that's just the definition. I'm sorry about that. Um, concept number two uh, is structures have two non-adjacent permeable walls, unblocked walls that allow cross ventilation must have CO2 monitoring in areas with no direct path, uh, not within direct path of air. So what this is talking about again is uh, a potential four wall structure. You have, you know, let's say on the east wall, you have two large bay doors. On the west wall, you have a bunch of exterior windows that can be opened to allow cross ventilation. Uh, that is allowed. And you can use that at 25% uh, occupancy set by fire code. Now the areas that don't fall in the direct path of those openings in that building, which is being defined as the, the path of air to travel and cross ventilate, there needs to be CO2 monitors in those, um, for lack of a better term, stagnant areas. Um, so there's that. Um, so those are the two uh, concepts that have really um, led to some confusion around whether indoor dining is allowed or not. Um, this is not considered indoor dining, this is considered open air structures or dining. So we're, it may be in an indoor setting, but we're allowing enough air turnover to keep the di carbon dioxide levels down, which is the measuring stick for knowing that we're diluting and getting rid of any droplets people are exhaling while they're sitting there eating their food. So I just wanted to clarify uh, the guidance on open air structures and that Indoor dining is not open until phase two at 25% occupancy. And that's my update on the, the open air structures and then dining for food establishments. Okay. Do we have any questions come in from that? Um, no, I don't believe so, not on that. Um, so thank you, Sean, for that update. Um, if uh, restaurants do have questions, uh, do you know what number they should call? Uh, yes, uh, for restaurants, uh, they can call our main line which is the 575-4040, uh, or they can call our uh, Environmental Health Help Desk at 509-249-6508. Uh, um, and an environmental health uh, staff member uh, will get back to you and answer any questions you might have. Um, so those are the, the best ways to contact us if you'd like to call. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, so that's all we have for today's update. Uh, we did intend to have this update live on our Facebook, but due to technical difficulties, uh, we were unable to do that. Um, so now we'll just uh, upload this onto YouTube and share it on to our social media. If you uh, have questions that you would like to I'd like us to answer uh, for the next update, please leave them in the comment section below of this post. Uh, thank you all for watching. See you next week. Mm -hmm.